Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Catherine. If you're new here, I'm so glad you're joining me today. I'm going to be sharing my story with you. It is a long story, so I won't be able to share all of it all at once, but this is just going to be part one of two where I'll share the rest of it next week. So I have, I wanted to share this for a really long time with you guys here on my channel, but I just haven't felt the time was right. I've been working on a book, which I have shared, and I just kind of wanted to stay in that headspace for the book and not really just be talking a lot about it on this platform, but it's time. If you want to go grab like a warm cup of coffee or a hot tea or your favorite beverage and just come join me on the couch like I really wish you could just be hanging out with me here at my house and I could share some things that God has done through my life with you one-on-one -on -one. but here we are and this is the way that I get to do it so let's hang out together if you need to press pause and go get that drink go right ahead and do that I just gonna share little pieces of my story I'm not gonna get very graphic but I just do want to share how I ended up where I was and eventually how I got free from from that and how God helped me all the way and still helps me even to this day in this moment as I'm recording this for you guys right now. <laughs> He's helping me to speak. Uh, when I decided to write my story, it was actually something I, I never thought I would do, but I was encouraged by some people that know and love me and, and knew what I had been through. They encouraged me to write it because they couldn't really believe I got to where I was based on what I'd been through. and. After kind of listening to those little like nudges of encouragement, like you should do it for a little while, I decided mm, maybe I can, okay. And then I really went through this whole process of, you know, battling myself, can I, I don't know, until I finally decided I was gonna do it. I'm the type of person that when I decide I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it, it just may take me forever, but I'm gonna get it done. And there was times when my husband would say like, how's your writing going? And I'm like, well, I haven't really written in three months, so it's not really going anywhere. Because writing this story, even though I knew it was gonna be a little bit difficult, I didn't realize it was gonna be as difficult as it was at all, like emotionally draining. Prior to writing the story, I've already been through a lot of healing. Like I went through a ton of healing between me and God. I've never been to therapy, but I have been through some counseling here and there, but primarily God is my counselor. That's really where a lot of my healing came from. And I know that in the process of writing, God did not reveal everything to me at once when I thought I was healed because as I was writing, I was almost getting mad. Like I thought I was good. I thought this was taken care of and God would reveal to me. And I couldn't give it to you all at one time because if I did, it would overwhelm you. So we're just gonna work on a new layer. We're getting a little deeper. There's some things that are still deep seated in you that need to be pulled out. And the pruning process and the, the gardening process of my soul and my heart was not an easy one. And it was a, a very um, trying one and one that I wanted to quit doing because nobody likes pain, but I wasn't gonna be in pain one way or the other. I was either holding on to the pain and trying to ignore it, and eventually that would show up on the outside of me, or I was going to deal with the pain. It was painful in the process, but then on the other side, I would be healed. So in order to heal, we have to feel, which wasn't fun. I didn't like it at all, and then we can deal. So that's kind of the process of how the writing went. I grew up in a really secluded area. I didn't have a lot of like, you know, outside influences. I came from a really big family. I grew up with six siblings in my home, you know, as a small child and things were busy and I helped my mom out a lot. And uh, she was an amazing mom. She was like who I would consider to be like the modern day June Cleaver. She just could do it all. She could garden, she could sew clothes, she could bake the best cakes and decorate things. And she just had such an amazing creative ability. But I, I remember admiring it, but I didn't realize really how amazing she was until I was an adult. She's not with us anymore. She went to be with Jesus. But as I think of her, there are sometimes I just would go back and think like, wow, she was really amazing. There, she really could do no wrong in my eyes, you know, all the way till I was 12 years old. She was like my best friend, really my best friend and encourager. And she was busy. She was a busy mom. She did the best she could. And I was like mommy number two in the house because I was the second in line and the first girl. So I really just helped out a lot, a lot with little kids. And the man that lived in our home, who I thought was actually my real dad, um, was abusing my mom physically and one of my siblings. And 
and abusing me. All of our abuse looked different and I go into that a lot more in detail in the book. The abuse was rough and it was really rough for me because I thought, you know, this is a man I, I really thought was my dad who I came to find out later in my life wasn't my dad and I'll share about that later. But I thought, why doesn't my dad love me? Like, what is wrong with me? You know, and so I started developing all of these ideas about myself that I thought something was wrong with me based on what was happening to me and the way that I was treated. I was treated as though I was discarded damaged goods, something that, you know, would have been a defect at a factory that maybe, you know, just was thrown outside in the dumpster by the man that I called dad. And I never could understand, so I just really grappled with my identity. I, I hated myself. I was angry at life. I was angry at him. I was angry at me uh, and I couldn't tell anybody what was going on because I was told if I told anyone that there was going to be some really serious consequences and so I didn't share what was happening I just kept it all inside zipped my lip and tried to plow through your life but because of what was happening to me and the uncertainty and the fear that I lived in I started to develop a lot of unhealthy habits and one of those was eating. I overate constantly to try and soothe myself in some way, to try and make things better. And I became very overweight at the time I was eight years old and struggled with weight because of the unhealthy relationship that I had with food because of the unhealthy things I was dealing with in life. And I just really turned to food to try and comfort me, to try and give me some solace, you know, and it didn't really work, but for maybe a moment, you know, and then I was feeling really bad and gross. I also ate a lot because I thought if I ate a lot and I wasn't thin and I didn't, you know, look like a supermodel because that's what I was told was pretty, that I wouldn't be messed with. He would leave me alone. And it didn't work, unfortunately. And uh, at one point, after many, many years of enduring this abuse from my stepdad, at 12 years old, my, my mom actually uh, walked in on it happening and, and a lot of things happened in the process of that. And, you know, it wasn't fun because I thought she was gonna be hurt and it wasn't fun because she kicked him out and then she let him back in and then a lot of things happened that just really wounded me over and over and over again because what I was living with prior to being 12 years old was like steady wounds like these wounds that I knew were going to come at least I knew what to expect even if it was negative and bad really bad stuff at least I kind of knew like I should expect this kind of treatment this is what's going to happen to me but once I turned 12 something happened when my mom didn't stand up for me in a way that I thought she should that made I, like my whole world came crashing down. And I think at that point in time, I started battling even greater thoughts of suicide and I was very depressed and anxious and had a lot of anger. Eventually my mom ended up divorcing my stepdad. It took a while, but we got there. And then things were pretty good, I thought, for a little while. It was hard, like we didn't have any money and you know things were a little tight there, but it was okay, it was better to me. So after like a short reprieve from the crazy of life, I felt like everything might be okay. You know, I thought, okay, we're good. Like what's gonna happen, we're moving on. Even though I wasn't really allowed to deal with what I was feeling, I was actually told I better not ever tell anyone what happened to me. So I still had to shove it all down. But even though I still felt like what I was getting ready to deal with was better than anything I ever had dealt with in the past. So I did my best to help my mom. You know, I saw her struggling emotionally. I saw her struggling. How am I gonna take care of these kids? What am I gonna do? And enduring abuse herself for so many years just to try to provide for our family and to try and make sure that we were fed. And a friend eventually, you know, invited her to leave all her troubles at the bottom of a bottle. And that's kind of where she stayed the majority of the next you know, 10 years of my life <laughs> and it was hard. So she ended up meeting this guy, she got remarried and he was no better except for that he was not uh, sexually abusing me, thank God. He was just very verbally abusive. And when I was 15 years old, I could not take it anymore. I just said, hey, I'm done. I really, I can't handle this. Anything is better than this, like anything. And so I ended up getting married so that I could become emancipated. And 
it was really crazy when I think back on like, wow, you really did some crazy things and God really kept you safe from so much. And he did. And I'm so thankful for that. And there's a lot of details that go around this stuff, but that's why I wrote the book because there's so much. I could never just sit and share everything with you all at one time, but you can read the book and find out more. It's crazy. <laughs> like as I'm reading it, I'm like, how in the world? I don't even know, but God, that's how. And so anyways, so I ended up being married to, um, someone who was not even much older than me and I had just met him, but he had this proposal, he's, you know, marriage proposal and a proposal that if we were to be married, I would not have to live in the house that I was living in anymore and I could move out. And so I did, I did that exact thing. Like that was the better option for me at the time. I was almost 16, uh, actually just two months shy of being 16 when I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I did not think my mom would go for it though at all, but she did like not even putting up a fight and saying, sure, I'll sign the papers. And I was free, a free adult at the age of 15, almost 16 years old. And I lived with this guy for nine months. I continued going to high school and I kept doing the right thing. I went and got a job and, and uh, then some crazy stuff started happening in this relationship, go figure. <laughs> and I didn't really have a relationship with God. I, I knew that I was saved. I had an encounter with Jesus when I was 11 years old, but I did not have a relationship with God. I really viewed my relationship with God like me knowing a movie star. Like if I know who Taylor Swift is, which I do, oh, everybody does, right? We can say we know Taylor Swift, but we don't really know who she is. We just know of her. And that was my relationship with God. I don't know what makes Taylor Swift mad. I don't know what makes her happy. I don't know what makes her laugh. I don't know what her favorite color is. Like I can, I can probably find some of that stuff on the internet, but like I still won't know her if I passed her on the street and was like, Hey girl, I want to go get some coffee. She'd be like, and security, like she does not know me. And that was, how I was with God and it was really tough. I, I didn't go to God and ask him for help. I never went to him for advice. I didn't have anybody leading me or guiding me in any direction. It was all me. I just decided what I needed to do and I did it the best that I knew how. So after I was with this guy for nine months, there was some really crazy things that kind of came to the surface. There was really hard, drugs that were being done. There was a lot of unfaithfulness happening behind the scenes that I wasn't aware of. And once it all came to the surface, I just said, okay, like I cannot do this anymore. I've picked the wrong choice, but again, it better than what I was in. But now what do I do? So I called this man's sister and I just said, I, I can't do this. This happened. I shared with her what was going on. And I just said, here's what's been happening. And I've just tried to ignore it. Yes, some lamps flew at my head a couple times. I ignored that. Like, well, um, he probably won't do it again. And, uh, you know, a few times he punched some holes in the wall. Meh, maybe he won't do that again. I just kind of dealt with that. Or, well, he's, you know, doing some illegal things well, maybe I can overlook that and like pretend it's not happening. That's what I was living with. And I just made excuses because that's what I grew up watching. That's what I knew. And I felt like it was better than what I was dealing with at home. So I just kind of needed to put up with it until I really couldn't put up with it anymore, like at all. And I reached out and I said like, Hey, here's what's going on. And she offered me a home and said, Let's just let him get his act together. You just come stay with me. And that's what I did. When I left, I thought, okay, in my little sweet 16 year old mind, I thought I'm gonna leave and he's gonna get his act together and he's gonna stop being mean and he's gonna love me the way he should. And he's gonna come back for me. He's gonna come bang the door down and say, hey, come home, I want you back. But that's not how it worked at all. He did not. He actually got a Greyhound bus ticket and drove away, far away. And I never saw him again. And that was difficult for me, very difficult because it was just another jab at my identity. Like here's who you think you are, but here's really who you are. And this whole time is the enemy of my soul whispering lies to me based on what was happening around me. He would give me these scenarios and then suggest this is happening because it's all your fault. This is happening because you're unlovable. This is happening because you're not worthy of anything. 
and you're worthless. Those were things I heard a lot in my own mind and believed about myself, fully 100% believe those to be true. And I would argue you down to tell you that I am worth nothing, like at one point in my life, really. I was just really beat down. After living with uh, this guy's sister for a little while, things just got really crazy and it was a very volatile environment and I was afraid to like ever speak up because she was very, um, she was like an eruptor, like erupting everywhere. So I really wasn't sure what was safe to say, if she was going to be mad that day, you know, what, what kind of mood was she in? Plus not only did we live together and she opened up her home now we're working together as well. So we were spending a lot of time together. She's got two kids, a husband, she's in her, you know, 40s. I'm just 17 year old me trying to figure out life and trying to just be quiet because I really was good at one thing, being quiet and being compliant. <laughs> that was kind of my thing. Like I knew how to do those very well. So I, I didn't know what I was doing wrong, but I knew that I was doing something because she was like mad at me more and more every day until a big event finally happened where I walked in on her in the bathroom while she was in the bathtub on accident and she like freaked out and ended up kicking me out of her house that very same day, like within five minutes of the accidental walking into the bathroom. And I, I don't exactly know why, I just know she did and there was never any further explanation than that. So I packed up my two little bags that I had, which was everything that I owned. And I just started walking and I walked to the nearest baseball field and I found a little dugout and I put my head on one of the bags and curled up on the bench and cried. <laughs> That's what I did. And I just said, God, how can you be good and let me lay here in this dugout like this? And I remember not ever really talking to God unless I was really upset or distraught. And it was usually then I was pointing my finger at him saying, how could you let this happen? Why didn't you? You know, where were you? And I was so upset at him, so angry at him because I thought my circumstances are what they are and you haven't done anything to help me. What is going on? And I just laid there and I, I, I basically, you know, yelled at the moon and got upset at God and finally I just gave up and I, and, and I just laid there and I thought what am I going to do? How am I going to make it? How am I going to get to work? How am I going to get a place? I can't go home. There's no way I can live with that guy my mom's married to. What do I do? Now I'm 17 and I'm homeless. What am I going to do with my life? How am I going to survive? I don't have a car to get to my job and I'm sleeping in a dugout in a baseball field. So I went to the nearest payphone and I called my boss and I said, Hey, I am not going to be into work. I'm sorry. Here's what's happened. I can't get there. Surprisingly, he offered to give me a ride and, um, you know, told me that if I needed somebody to pick me up, he'd be glad to do it. And I thought, wow, that's really nice of you. But what I said was, well, I appreciate the offer, but I really won't be able to come in because if I go to work, then I won't have a way to get back here. And this is the safer place to sleep than it is in the town that I actually worked. <laughs> so I said, I don't think that's going to work. I, I just I don't have a place to stay and I can't stay in that city on the streets. I just know that. Next thing he said really shocked me more than anything. He said, you don't have to sleep on the streets. I have an extra room if you need it. And I was like, what? And the moment he said that, everything inside me started screaming, don't do it, don't do it, don't say yes, no way, Jose. Like, say no thank you and figure something else out. But before I could even process my thoughts truly, I said, yes, thank you, that would be so great, as long as your girlfriend doesn't mind. And there was a big problem because I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes of their life, but I was about to find out. So I'm gonna share that with you guys next week um, and why I chose to do the stupid things I did because of the things I believed about myself for so long and how eventually getting free from those was so incredibly vital to me being free from the cycle of abuse in my life and not only getting out of the abuse, but then beginning to heal and beginning to really process the past trauma and the pain that was lingering within me that I really needed to deal with, but I didn't know how. And I wanna share with you guys what God did for me. So you guys wanna check out how you can get a hold of my book. I'm gonna put a link 
link in the description below for you guys to do that. I'm going to be sharing a lot more about my story. I do share a lot more about my story even on my website. As a matter of fact, I do have a blog there as well. But if you guys want to pre-order the book, you just go to my website, which will actually launch on September 21st. And I created this amazing journal to go along with it. And that will be available for order right after the launch. So you guys be watching for that as well. Thanks so much though for just listening and hanging out with me while I just share a little bit more of where not just where I am but where I've been and where I'm going so that you guys will kind of like know so that you will be encouraged that you know you're not alone and it's a crazy statistic but like every three out of five women are sexually abused before the age of 12 and it is insane to me to think that so much of that happens but we still feel so incredibly alone and in this little box like nobody gets it nobody knows and it's not just uh, sexual abuse that can cause a lot of trauma and issues for us there's so many other things that happen maybe you had a parent that was very negative and and condescending or maybe you had a teacher that spoke terrible to you and called you names and made you believe certain things about yourself that weren't true but you believe them as truth and kind of started to hold on to those as your own identity and now you're in an identity crisis like I was for so long the title of my book is actually behind enemy lies and I chose that title because it really just depicts this picture of being held captive by lies, the things that we believe based on what's been done to us. And we believe things about ourselves and the world around us. And we believe these lies. And when we do that, we are not accepting the truth of who we actually are and who we actually are created to be. We start to kind of settle into this place of, well, this is all that I can do, or this is as good as I am, or this is as much as I deserve, which is something I really believed about myself for a really long time. And I'm not worthy of success. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy, you know, the things like those are all lies. And so I was held captive as a little girl in this self-imposed prison, what I kind of view as like a concentration camp in my mind and I didn't really know that there was another way out I didn't know there was something besides what I knew so I was like stuck in this place that I didn't know how to get out of anytime I would try to like put my head up over the wall and see like is there something over there am I not seeing it what's going on fear would just scream and, and slam its fist down and say like keep your eyes on the ground keep your eyes over here don't look that direction pay attention over here like distracting and reminding me of all of the terrible things that I was or all the things I wasn't enough of or all the things I was too much of and I would just go, okay, yeah, you're right, fear. I'm going to stay right where I'm supposed to be, shackled and bound in this self-imposed prison. And finally, I started to make my way kind of closer to the gate and realized the gate was actually open the whole entire time. And I could hear a voice on the other side calling me out, calling me, saying, hey, there's freedom over here. Hey, it's a better way. Hey, there's something going on that I need you to see. And I eventually got brave enough to step outside of the gate and to step out from the wall of fear and say, okay, what's over here? I don't know. Let's see. Maybe it's better until I got about three steps out and was like, maybe it's worse. I'm, I don't know what to, I don't know how to live over here. I don't know what to do in freedom land. I'm going back to the only place I knew, which was not a good place. And I would run back into my prison cell or my prison camp and I would just stay there and think about what could be, what might be, what if, is it better? I don't know. Maybe it is. And the whole time I kind of would be listening to that little voice on the other side, continuing to speak truth and continuing to tell me that there was a better way. And eventually I started to believe that voice more than I believed the voice of, of fear and the voice that said, Hey, you need to stay over here. You're not allowed to go past this. This is it for you. This is all you can do. And I just kicked that gate open and ran straight out it and then never turned back. I just got, you know, I was set free and God is an amazing God who wants to rescue you. And he has a redemption story and he is a God of restoration. And that's why I created some of the amazing merch that I did. It's called rescued, restored, and redeemed. I am his collection. I'm going to be giving away some of that merch on some of my social media platforms. So you guys can follow me on Instagram. If you don't already, you can follow me on my Facebook page. I'll put links to those in the description below so you can find those easily. And I will be giving away 
away some uh, amazing merch plus some free books and some free journals and some really neat stuff. So you guys be watching out for that. And don't forget to share it with your friends. If you know somebody who's in a really hard place and they may be able to glean from someone else's story, it is technically a memoir, but it is not a memoir like traditional. It's very different and unique. So I hope you guys will get your hands on a copy of it and it will encourage you and bless you. So you guys go check out those links. If you have any questions for me though, please reach out. So thanks so much you guys for hanging out and listening to my story today. And I look forward to sharing part two with you next week. Talk to you soon. Bye.